We all know Houdini is great for doing simulations, for working with particles, and just all kinds of fun procedural nonsense. But one thing I particularly like about Houdini is that it's a very good tool for data visualization, because it just happily imports any kind of data table that you throw at it, and you can then handle that data with all the flexibility of Houdini. If you want some examples of data viz inside Houdini, there are plenty of relevant syntagma tutorials, including ones that use picture data, biomedical data, and lots and lots of geospatial data. When you're doing data viz on a data set that's a bit less familiar, or if you're trying to tell a particular story about that data, it can be incredibly helpful to get a sense of how that data is distributed. And this is why clustering is so interesting. Finding underlying groups or clusters in your data can help give a sense of how the data is organized, which will help you visualize and ultimately explain the data. So clustering is potentially very useful, but as soon as you start digging into it, there are several different algorithms out there and explanations of how they work are often either very mathematical or quite specific for a particular language like Python or R. So in this little mini-series, I'm going to show you a few different algorithms and how you can build them inside of Houdini. Today, we're starting with the OG of clustering algorithms, k-means clustering. We're then hopping over to Patreon, where we'll handle some of the more intricate ones, such as dbscan and hdbscan, and we'll cover minimum spanning trees along the way as well. We'll wrap up with an applications video where we'll explore how well these three clustering approaches work in different data viz scenarios. So what are the features that we're looking for in a clustering algorithm? For me, there are four criteria. One, it needs to be user-friendly because I don't want to have to try out all kinds of unintuitive variables. Two, it needs to be able to find unexpected, weirdly shaped clusters. Three, it should be able to handle noisy data. And four, ideally, it needs to be quick. So before we dive into Houdini, let's have a look at what k-means clustering actually does. Here's a data set where you can clearly see three different clusters. The first thing we need to do is to figure out how many clusters we want. So this is the k in k-means clustering. So here we'll say k is three, and we're going to pick three random starting points. Next, we're measuring the distance between each point and these three starting points. We then assign each point to its nearest cluster. And the third step is to calculate the mean position of each cluster. And that mean will be the starting point for the next iteration. And then you do several iterations of this until you get to a consistent result. So let's head over to Houdini and build this. So inside Houdini, we're going to start by making a 2D data set quite similar to the one we were just looking at. So drop down a geo container dive inside, and let's create a grid. So to this grid, we're going to add an attribute noise. Which will be a float, which we'll call density. We then add a scatter node. We check the density attributes, scatter maybe 500 points and we switch off the relax iterations. And then we see that our points aren't particularly well clustered here. So let's go back to our attribute noise. Uh, let's set the element size to two, enable the remap ramp, and we start adjusting the ramp until we see something that looks a little bit more well clustered. Something like this maybe. Next, we want to set our cluster count. So we'll add a wrangle. We'll set this to detail and let's maybe use a slider for this. So we'll go integer cluster number is a channel integer called number of clusters. Hit this button to create it. And looking at this uh, data set, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So six clusters. And let's write that out to the attribute. So integer at cluster num equals cluster num. If we head over to the geometry spreadsheet and go to the details tab, we see we have a detail attribute called cluster num with a value of six. Next, let's maybe randomize our point numbers with a sort node that we can set to random. This isn't essential, but it's nice to make sure that the point numbers are mixed up pretty randomly. Then we want to create a group with our starting points. So we'll use the group by range node. We'll call our group starts 
it will be a point group. And then in the start box here, we'll refer to the cluster num attribute that we just created by grabbing the detail attributes stream zero, the attribute is called cluster num, and it's just a single integer, so the index is zero. And we need to invert the range. And so now we've picked six random starting points. Next, we want to give our cluster some numbers. So let's drop down another wrangle. Let's run this only over our start group. Let's create an integer ID called at cluster. And let's uh, just refer to the point number here. So at PT num. Then we'll do our first round of assigning points to one of our clusters. We'll need a wrangle, which we'll call find and assign clusters. In here, first we'll need an integer with the maximum number of clusters, which we've saved as a detail attribute. So integer cluster max. We want to grab that detail attribute that we saved stream zero called cluster num. We're also going to initialize an empty float array where we're going to store the distances to the center of each cluster. And we'll use that to figure out which cluster to assign a particular point to. So we'll call this empty array cluster dists. And then we're going to run a for loop. So we'll need a counting variable i. We want to run this as long as i is smaller than our cluster max. And then we want to increment. Inside the loop, we need to read out each of our cluster centers, which at this stage is just the position of our cluster starting point. So vector cluster center is a point on stream zero. We want to read the position of the point with the index i. Then we want to calculate the distance from the currently evaluated point to the cluster center. So float dist is the distance between the p and the cluster center. And then we want to append this distance to our cluster dists array. So append to the array cluster dists. We want to append the dist. And there's a typo here that should be a float. So what we're doing here for each point is calculating the distance to each cluster center for each point, And then we're putting those distances in an array. Next, we need to find the closest cluster center. So the smallest value in the array. And we can simply do that with the min function. So float cluster dist equals the minimum of cluster dists. And then we want to find the ID of the cluster with that smallest distance. And that's just the same as the index of that smallest value in the array. So we can go integer cluster ID is find in the array cluster dists. We want to find that cluster dist. And finally, we want to save that cluster ID as an attribute of integer at cluster ID equals cluster ID. If we now drop down a color node, set it to point and set the color type to random from attributes using our cluster ID as the attribute, you see that we've successfully assigned some clusters. So if we now go back to our sort node and change the, the random seed, then you can see that we're changing different starting points and we're getting different clustering behavior. But this clustering isn't particularly great, right? Because you see that this population here is cut in half. There's three populations here. It's not great. So to refine this cluster identification, k-means needs to run in iterations in order to optimize itself. So let's drop down a solver behind our initial cluster assignment. Let's copy the find and assign clusters and dive inside. In here, we need to paste this find and assign clusters wrangle, look it up, but we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you remember, the first iteration of k-means just uses the locations of starting points. But in the successive iterations, you need the centers of your clusters. I guess we could do that in vex, but I'm going to be lazy. So let's drop down a for each loop. Set it to run over points with, that, as a piece attribute, the cluster ID. And then if we put an extract centroid in here, set to run over detail, we'll create our center points. And now we pipe this into the second slot of our wrangle, and then we need to get the cluster center from the slot with the input one. So let's save, let's head up one level, let's rewind. 
now you can see that if you go through the frames, it progressively refines until it settles into a cluster alignment. Now, what I haven't told you yet is that there's actually a node for all of this inside Houdini. It's called the cluster node, surprisingly, and it works based on k-means. So you can set all the input parameters that we've used as well, the number of clusters, which we saved as a detail attribute, the number of iterations, which is how many frames we want the solver to run for in our setup, and the starting seed that is similar to the seed in our random sort node. Now, the big advantage of this cluster node is that you can add as many attributes as you want, not just the position that we're using in our setup. So this node can handle multi-dimensional clustering, which is a nice feature. So the big question, is this algorithm any good? Well, we defined four criteria for a cluster algorithm at the start, so let's see how it holds up. First up, it's very quick, which is good. But beyond that, k-means starts to fall apart a bit. It doesn't do well on user-friendliness because we have to know in advance how many clusters we're going to want to see. There's no real way of knowing this without looking at the data, so for a complex data set you just have to try out a whole bunch of values and see what works best. That's a massive pain, and it's one of the main disadvantages of k-means. The last two criteria are noise and weirdly shaped clusters. So let's have a look at these. If we add a second scatter node and just uniformly drop a hundred or so points down, and if we merge that in with our initial scatter distribution, we can see that the data is now a bit noisy. If we go back to the end, hit rewind for the solver to reset itself and then flick through the frames, you can see that k-means just automatically assigns these points to the nearest cluster, even if they're not actually clustering together very much. Because real-life data is noisy, it would be great if we can actually take that noise into account in our cluster algorithm and not just assign noise to our existing clusters. And lastly, there's the weirdly shaped clusters. Here I've created another noise, which has some more swirly cluster shapes. I'd say this one has maybe four clusters, one, two, three, and a big one here in the middle. So let's go into our set cluster num, set the number of clusters to four, hit rewind, go back to the bottom and flick through the frames. Either through our own algorithm or through the cluster sop, you'll see that it can't handle these weirdly shaped clusters like the big one in the middle here. And that's because it's assigning points that lie within a particular radius of the cluster center. So your cluster shape will always be a sphere. And that's just not what real life data looks like. So clustering with k-means, it's quick, it's not very user-friendly, it's not very good with noisy data, and it's not very good with any data that's not perfectly spherical. So let's see if we can do better. For the next video in this series, we're going to tackle DB scan, or density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise. That sounds a bit more promising, doesn't it? For that one, and Houdini tutorials on DataViz, and much, much more, head on over to the Antagma Patreon. Hope you'll join me there. Till then, thanks for watching.